Father O'Brien lectures in the area of ecclesiology. He writes in the area of Jesuit spirituality and history. In 2011, he published a book, The Ignatian Adventure, Experiencing the Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius in Daily Life. Father O'Brien has taught and has served in the chaplaincies of Fordham, St. Joe's University, Loyola University, and Lemoyne College. I welcome him to share his knowledge and his experience for our opening address. Welcome. Yeah. So thank you all very much uh, for your welcome. Um, it's both fitting and ironic that the Marianists sponsor uh, this keynote because there are many Jesuit high schools who compete against Marianist high schools by the name of Chaminade. So this is very ecumenical outreach. Thank you very much. I'm not sure the Jesuits would be as gracious. So thank you to the, to the Marianists. Uh, it's a delight to be here, uh, and over the course, gosh, this is probably 18 months ago that Debbie reached out and said, um, would you consider giving the keynote? And I know that um, my good friends uh, Mark Thibodeau and Jim Martin have uh, presented to this group, and they, sp they spoke very highly of the work that you do. And having learned about the work you do through the tireless efforts of the executive committee, um, Debbie is a um, force of nature on her own. Thank you to Debbie. Um, uh, she got me here and prepared me well, and I'm delighted to share with you um, under the, the topic, it's pretty broad, about um, discernment. So the Jesuit Guide uh, to Discernment, which I think will be fitting, given what we've heard about Pope Francis. And as you listen to, and as, to him speak, and as you read his encyclicals and letters and addresses, that's, besides joy and mercy, this is, this is, the word that gets most attention from Pope Francis. Joy and mercy, you will hear constantly as a refrain from the Holy Father. But then discernment is also, he speaks of that often, particularly in the Synod and the Family and in the, his letter, Amoris Laetitia. And so perhaps this might be a window as we anticipate the next synod and his reflection on how the church can discern better our life together. And as you lead others in the path of discernment, what might be behind Pope Francis's thinking on discernment? Because he was fashioned and formed as a Jesuit. I think part of how he speaks about discernment is informed by his own Jesuit training and formation. And he was steeped in it since the age of 19 or so. But understand that as a Jesuit, a young, fairly young Jesuit in uh, Argentina, he was put in charge of younger Jesuits as a novice director. And then he led Jesuits who were in training studying theology and philosophy. So his job was to teach the Jesuit tradition of discernment to others. Now I offer this to you not as some sort of like, this is the only way to do it. This is just the way that I know how to do it. Um, because I was trained as a Jesuit. This is my path, one of my paths to holiness. It's just not the only one. So I don't presume that this will be anyone else's, but I just want to share for you my own experience of discernment as I've learned it and lived it in the Jesuit tradition. We know that it's biblical. You know, St. Paul will speak about discernment. It's steeped in the traditions of other religious orders represented it here. So I, I state that out front in a perhaps uncharacteristic sign of humility coming from a Jesuit. Um, this is not the only way, it's just one way. I also share this with you, having accompanied a lot of young people. Most of my ministry in my 20 years as a Jesuit has been with college-age students. Um, first at Le Moyne, at different you know, uh, experiences teaching and serving in the chaplaincies of, uh, of our colleges, Le Moyne College and Fordham. Uh, St. Joe's University, where I taught for a couple of years. I spent the last eight years at Georgetown University, most recently serving as vice president for mission, where my job was to share the Jesuit charism with our 
faculty, staff, and students. And then I just left um, Georgetown to take on the role as dean of the Jesuit School of Theology at Santa Clara University, which is located in Berkeley. And there I'm, I'm talking with young grad students about what it means to be trained as theologians and practitioners of theology today, both Jesuits and other religious and, and priests, and also laymen and women. So that's my experience that I share with you today, the fruit of my experience. I tried to capture uh, some of this thinking in, in my book, and I admit to you, this is the plug, um, uh, The Ignatian Adventure, which is published by Loyola Press, and I just got a text from Loyola Press saying, Kevin, don't forget to plug the book. <laughs> so I've done it. But they've also said, uh, we will, we are, we're gonna offer a 30% discount to anyone who wants to buy it. So here's a code. If you go to the Loyola Press website, they're gonna offer you the book for $10. You just need to put the promotion code 4729. 4729. Now, they were, we also had a Federal Express issue. They were, that uh, books were supposed to arrive uh, yesterday, they did not. So I offer this promotional code to you, 4729, 4729, at the Loyola Press website um, if you want to order a copy of the Ignatian Adventure. Again, that was just that, I wrote that because of my experience walking with young people in discernment. And what I tried to do is to take the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius and apply them to people living and working in the midst of their daily lives today. So, shall we begin our, um, uh, our time together reflecting on discernment? So, let's first begin, you know, what is uh, discernment? Um, very basically, making decisions in which God is part of the conversation. I mean, that's the way I experience discernment. It's just not about decision making, and we need to make a lot of decisions in life, but making decisions in which God is part of the conversation. Every decision does not have to be a discernment, right? I sometimes, I think we overplay the word discernment, especially if you're in um, formation or you're in a school of theology. Father, let me discern that. And I said, well, actually, there's really nothing to discern. You need to write the paper, and you need to do the studying. Every decision is not a discernment. I think sometimes we cheapen discernment by turning every decision into the discernments. God has given us wisdom or practical knowledge to make decisions. So we can liberate discernment from the need to decide every possible thing in a human life, right? Let me share with you one story of discernment, and it is, uh, it is my own. So uh, I went to, oh, okay, I went to, <laughs> I went to Georgetown, okay, we could just go live because I'm just going to tell a story of discernment. Um, so I went to, I uh, grew up in an Irish Catholic family in South Florida, um, pretty traditional upbringing, Catholic schools my whole life, thanks to the Oblates of Mary Immaculate in my high school. Um, then I went to Georgetown to study. Now, the reason I went there, there was a, a lovely nun, um, a Dominican sister, who said to me, Kevin, I want you to go to Georgetown. Um, they send more um, young men to the Jesuits than any other university, which is not the pitch you want to hear as a high school senior. Despite that advice, I went because I was interested in, in politics. I, 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 want, I love politics, and I thought about perhaps serving in politics or government. So I went to Georgia and had a great experience there and uh, found myself immersed in Washington, D.C. in the desire to serve. And so after, after uh, Georgia, I went to law school with that desire, I want to I wanna get involved in government and politics. Now, understand there was um, a lot of nobility in that decision. I did want to change the world like so many 22-year-olds. I didn't want to make an impact. I didn't want to serve. Admittedly, too, there was a lot of unhealthy ambition perhaps a lack of creativity in that decision as well. In the 80s, everyone seemed to be going to law school, and I just joined them. So we're, we're people of mixed motives, aren't we? And we try to discern those mixed motivations, and God wastes nothing. God worked through all of it. So off I went to law school, had a great, I love law school. 
I loved learning about the law. I loved learning what I could do with it. But then I went to practice law, which I did not like very much. I was a corporate litigator. And while I learned a lot, I found myself becoming more and more empty. Now, the catch is, I didn't realize it. I was working so hard and so wrapped up in my ambitioning that I didn't quite realize what was happening to me. So a couple of things happened in that discernment. Number one, my best friend from second grade, and we must keep those best friends from second grade, because they can speak truth to us in ways no one else can. She turns to me and says, Kevin, one day at lunch, Kevin, you're not very happy which is a horrible thing to tell someone, right? In one sense, it's very good, but it's horrible to receive because I became like very defensive and very angry. How can you say I'm not happy? I've got this great job, making all this money. I've got this great career. Oh, but her observation sunk in deep. When I actually stopped back to consider, I really wasn't. When I got rid of all the clutter and the noise and the ambitioning and all the other stuff. Now, understand... Law is a good and noble profession, but it just wasn't for me. And the sign of that was that I was not very happy. And so I stopped back and I stepped back. Second thing that happened, I was a young lawyer in a very big case involving a lot of land in in South Florida. And our client was a 70-year-old Jewish woman, Marjorie, from from, uh, Brooklyn, a remarkable woman. And she was essentially uh, inheriting this land, but it was a very complicated case because um, the man who uh, gave her this, this great gift, um, in a sense, disinherited his own children. Uh, I should say that they both got a few million dollars each, <laughs> but they wanted everything. It was a very complicated case, and it was very emotional because you had to delve into this family, very complicated and sad family history. My job as young, a young lawyer was to take care of the client, and we would, Marjorie would often get upset by what, what we heard in court, and it was, the family history was extremely sad. So we had to justify why, why the, the man who died was favoring Marjorie so much. Well, one of the, we would walk around the courtroom. We would walk around the courthouse, I should say, on these emotional days in court. We'd just walk around the courthouse. And we'd listen and talk, and she'd talk about her life in Brooklyn and, and, and talk about the man who gave her this great gift and what she wanted to do with it at 78. Well, one day, we were doing the walking, and it hit me out in the hot floor of sun. I can remember exactly where I was. I can remember exactly how I felt. I can remember the moment. I said, I I thought to myself, I would rather be out here talking to her than inside the courtroom. And the other important thing there is I knew I was having that thought when I had it. And that's a very important step. Emily, my friend growing up who told me I wasn't very happy, she sort of woke me up and said, oh, maybe I'm not happy. The second moment, though, was me having a thought, I'd rather be out there with her, and then me noticing I was having the thought. That is, this thought was significant. So two levels of knowing there, right? That's important for discernment. It's not simply that we know something or that we have an insight, but that we know we are having the insight. We are starting to own it. It wasn't just like Emily or my parents or my priest or nun were telling me something, but I was actually owning it. About the same time, I got an offer to teach at a Catholic high school in the area. This is from a former teacher who is now a principal. And she said to me one day after a board meeting, Kevin, you should think about teaching. You'd be great. We just lost our social studies teacher. Come and teach with us. And I said, oh, thank you. But no thanks. I've got, you know, I've got this great career and I've got this law thing. And how could I go from teaching law, practicing law to teaching high school? Well, I couldn't get that out of my head. Two weeks later, I accepted the offer. Left my law practice to teach in a Catholic high school. Most people thought I was crazy. But people who really knew me said, this just makes absolute sense. And it was my years teaching high school, three years in a fairly underfunded Catholic high school, teaching social studies, coaching, even though I hadn't kicked a soccer ball in years. You know how it is, working in these underfunded schools, uh, starting a debate program. I loved it. My, I worked as hard as I did as a lawyer, but I knew the difference. I was full of joy. I was equally tired, but full of joy. There was a real difference there. 
So there, that story is, now listen, I could not articulate this in, the, in my 20s, right? This is the fruit of 20 years of reflection on that experience and writing a book and talking to good groups like this. But let me now unpack that. That's my story of discernment. You have your own and you will guide others in their own stories of discernment. But let me, um, let me now try to unpack some of that experience of God working inside and outside of me. Discernment in the Ignatian tradition, there's actually two types of, when we speak about, when Jesuits speak about discernment, we mean it in two different ways. And that's why you have to actually carefully listen to what Pope Francis is saying. There's two levels. One is what he calls discerning the spirits, which is biblical, St. Paul, and also Ignatian. Because St. Ignatius and the spiritual exercises offers us rules for discerning the spirits, which are very helpful. And in my book, The Ignatian Adventure, I try to unpack those rules for the discernment of spirits for people trying to discern today in the, in the course of their prayer, in the course of their living. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what that means, about what do you mean by discerning the spirits? That inside of ourselves, there are movements of consolation and desolation. There are, there are movements bringing us to God, to greater faith and hope and love, and there are spirits pulling us away from that. And we have to discern them. You listen to Pope Francis's reflections on the family, the synod on the family. He was saying, discern the spirits that are happening in the synod. Not afraid of voicing, people voicing difference, but discern when difference is voiced. Which Difference is leading to division. What spirit is leading us to greater hope and, and um, availability to the world and to greater mercy, which is leading us to, to tribalism and clericalism and all those other things the, point, the Pope points to as destructive to the church, discern the movements of the spirits. The other level is what he calls making an election. I have to be very nervous using that word election around these times. <laughs> This is a good type of election. We don't want this type of election to end, right? Basically making a big life decision or a change in the way of I live. Making election is making the big decision. Do I join the Jesuits? Do I get married? Do I change jobs? Do I try to simplify my life radically? These are big decisions. And discerning spirits are part of making an election. So one has to learn to discern the spirits, the interior landscape of one's life in order to make a good life choice or an election. So two levels. There's some theological assumptions, and I am a dean of a school of theology, so grant me this. It's very important to understand the operating theology that we bring to our discernment. It's very important to, bring, to, to be aware of the, our operating theology, not just the, the theology that we profess, but the theology that we live when we're working with people. And there are two underlying assumptions to this understanding of discernment. One is that God is at work and laboring in all creation. That God is at work and is laboring in all creation. The first theological assumption. That God is at work. That God is laboring. And therefore, as St. Ignatius would say, God can be found in all things. We, don't, we just have to slow down and listen. It's not that hard, but we make it hard by putting so much stuff in the way, we'll talk about this a little bit later, in the way of us finding God's activity. God is at work. God is laboring. We just have to notice. So actually, discernment is a lot easier than we think. Secondly, that God works through interior freedom above all. We are created, we are told in the book of Genesis, that we are created in the image of like, and likeness of God. Why is that? The way that we are most like God is not by physical appearance or attributes or talents that can come and go. The way that we are created in the image of God is that we have a freedom that is godly. The one thing that God gave us that God did not give rocks or salamanders or dogs is freedom. And that God will work through that. The freedom I speak about, though, is an interior freedom. It's a freedom that says we are not captive to all the pushes and pulls that we experience in our life. There's why discernment is so important. 
is the servant allows us to sift through all these interior, what St. Ignatius called these interior movements or emotions in the, in the soul, the feelings, the impulses, the desires, the passions. All those things are, are, are just part of being human. We're not to run from them. Passions, desires, attractions, feelings, it's being human. We have to discern them. The good passions, the good desires from those that lead us away from God are their self-destructive. So that what makes us unfree, temptations which are sinful or destructive or self-destructive. I think about resentment in my life. I'm Irish and we have long memories, we Irish. But resentment, as the great popular adage says, resentment is like taking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Right? It is self-destructive. I know that in my own disposition, resentment disturbs my interior freedom. It holds me back from being the person God has called me to be. Well, what might be your limit to freedom? What might be the limit to freedom in the person that you are discerning a vocation with? Interior freedom means we can notice it and we can work to be free of it with God's help and the help of others, like good spiritual directors. We are not captive, freedom means, we are not captive to the opinions or expectations of others. We listen to them, but we're not captive to them. We don't become a priest or a sister because mom or dad tells us to, because we choose it from a place of great interior freedom, that place God even Spez speaks so freely, that place deep within our heart, that inner sanctuary where God alone speaks to us. God even Spez. We are not captive to the opinions of others. We are free enough from, the, from what the world tells us to be to choose, actually, I can choose something different. So often, working with seniors in college, the temptation, gosh, do I get a job or do I work for, you know, like the Jesuit Volunteer Corps, a service corps of some kind. This is not a, this is a choice to discern, Right? Getting a job is not a bad thing. Going to Wall Street or, or, or working in finance or, or, or getting a good accounting job, or, or I, I, those are all good things. Sometimes we need money. Nothing wrong with that. People, got, people have to pay off college debt. Going to JVC and volunteer after college, that can be a great thing, but it's not necessarily your thing. We're not choosing between robbing a bank and going to Wall Street or going to the Jesuit Volunteer Corps. That's not a discernment. You don't rob a bank. But choosing between two good things, well, that's the stuff of discernment. In order to choose between two good things, we have to be free of the opinions and expectations of others to choose from that deep place of who I am. I choose it. I own it. And nor are we hijacked by our own experience, that we are reflective and not simply reactive that we are reflective, not simply reactive, that we are not hijacked by our own experience. By that I mean we are free enough from our experience to take a step back before we act. So often, I lived in a college dorm for eight years. I love her. I want to spend the rest of my life with her. After knowing her for two months, well, could be, but you may want to take a step back, and reflect and think, is this what I want for me now? with her. So often we're captive by these different passions. I, I, have, I, I love my major. I want to change the world. Absolutely. But let's think about how you're going to actually do that practically after college, right? So we try to be reflective on our experience. Now, I grant you, as we look, talk about freedom, we have to realize that there are limits to freedom which are not of our own making. So Sometimes we, we, are, are, we deal with deep psychological or emotional issues that will limit freedom. So we have to be aware of those and counsel those who deal with them to get help. So poverty, economic condition, race, ethnicity can limit us if we are victims of discrimination. We may be less free because society has put limits on us. So we, we have to acknowledge sort of the exterior limits to our freedom which are real in our culture and name them, particularly to, to people who feel excluded or marginalized because of what society 
or institutions placed on them. We have to work through those and acknowledge those. We have to acknowledge those deep hurts or issues, psychological, that may limit freedom. You know that as vocation promoters or discerners yourselves. So we have to be careful. I just want to state that up front because it really is important. But we're looking for interior freedom to the extent we can. Now, we'll never have complete interior freedom. We'll get that in the kingdom. We just hope we can become a little bit more free. So I want to work through um, uh, three questions that I think might help you, because they have helped me, guide someone in discerning their vocation. The first is, who is God for you? The second is, how is God calling you? And what is getting in the way? So three questions. And I, I want to work through those with the help of the wisdom of a lot of other people. I begin with the first one, who is God for you? Because so often, and I know this from my own experience, when I was in that transition from practicing law to teaching, I went to see a, 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 an Irish nun, and I said, oh, well, Sister, I want to, I think I might feel there's something in me. I think I, I have to, you know, I went to George. I knew the Jesuits. I feel this desire. I, something's happening. I'm going to start teaching. I, I think I, I need to know whether I should be a Jesuit. And she looked at me after I stammered on and she says, oh, that's good. Well, who is Jesus for you, Kevin? Jesus? <laughs> yeah, who is Jesus for you? For me? So we spent a year on that question. Sometimes we put the cart before the horse. We run to the, how is God calling me? What is God calling me to do? And we actually skip the most important question, who is God for me? You can't answer the second one freely without getting to the first. So this is why it is very important to work on images of God. Now, why do we need images of God? We all have images of God dancing in our head. Why do we need them? Why do we need images and symbols of God? Because God is God and we are not. God is close to us indeed, but God is ultimately transcendent. Holy mystery, as Rahner said. So we need images and symbols to bridge the gap. We just did it with our morning prayer in word and song, right? We need symbols and words to bridge the gap between us and God. Knowing that the image or the symbol is not God, it will always fall short. And we also have to realize that some images of God are helpful and some are not. So this is where you can rely on your own experience. What images of God, and we all have a variety of images of God dancing in our heads. There's classic images of God, the old man up in the clouds, usually white, right? That's why working with people from different ethnicities, work through racial images of God, racial pictures of God, and how that actually might help or hurt. But the grandfatherly type of God, sitting in the clouds who's sort of nice and helpful, well, that's a nice image of God. But it's not all of who God is. God the judge or the accountant keeping track of things, I dealt with that for years. Again, I was raised and I was Catholic, right? It's true, God is a judge. But God is not only a judge. God is also that kind and grandfatherly, grandmotherly type. There are those who, thanks to the you know, recent scholarship and the, and the trailblazing um, work of, of many women religious. I think of Sandra Schneiders. I think of Elizabeth Johnson and others who have broke open the scriptures to show us feminine images of God in scripture. So important, particularly working with young men and young women to show them that God is not simply masculine in attribute. We have to free our discerners from these notions so that they can find other paths and images of God. Again, one image will not do. You have to have a whole variety to tap into. Some will be hurtful, speaking to God, and some images of God will not be hurtful or, or not helpful. Some images won't be helpful to people. They actually might get in the way. Others, 
might open up a whole path or image to their future that they had never imagined. And just as good spiritual directors of vocation discerners, we, we have to be conscious of that. And there's a lot of literature that I encourage us to constantly be steeped in. There are biblical images of God, which can certainly help. God is rock. God is spirit. God is Abba, Father. An image that I'm becoming more captivated by from the uh, Jewish scriptures, the mother bird brooding over her children. It's a lovely image that speaks to me more. There's so, there's so many images of God in the scriptures that could be helpful to us. Jesus' image of the prodigal father. I love that story. And Pope Francis speaks about that story of the prodigal father or the prodigal son. A father who is prodigal or extravagant with his love. He speaks about it so often. Why? I love that image because after the son comes back from his wayward journey, the father comes out of the home to welcome him and does not, did not say, where were you? Where's my money? Who did you, who were you with? What did you do? Just said, welcome home. And we know for scripture scholars tells us that the parables among all the sayings of Jesus, those are sort of the most, hmm, the most reflective of what Jesus said and did, because there's lots of overlay, you know, in the in the in the new, in the Gospels. But there, you sort of, when you get to a parable, the good, the thinking of Scripture scholars is that's where actually you get to the heart of actually what he said through story. St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, who born in 1491, between you know the medieval age and the Renaissance. He had a lot of images of God to choose from, and he could have chosen a lot of those medieval, harsh images of God. What was Ignatius' image of God? A teacher who works with a student. A teacher who works with a student. That was very novel. It's not, it's not really a medieval image of God. From when we look at the arts of that time, a teacher who works with a student. What's so ironic is that Ignatius never wanted the Jesuits to open up a school. Why? He feared that the schools would tie us down too much. He, he imagined the Jesuits being these itinerant band of management consultants, basically, who, who saw a problem and need that no one else was meeting, go there, fix it, turn it back to the people, and move on. That was his idea of the Society of Jesus. We won't open up schools. They'll tie us down to a place too much. Ironic. I just left a place, Georgetown, which had been there for 225 years. Our oldest school is from 1550. It's ironic, too, because Jesus, uh, Ignatius' image of God was of a teacher. And why is that so important? What does a good teacher do? There's so many in this room. One who labors gently, passionately, persistently with a student. One who co-labors, is giving birth to ideas. One who is working with someone. God is laboring, wanting our success, wanting us to learn, wanting us to be who we are meant to be. God has a desire for us. God has a will for us. Now, I know when I was growing up, and probably most in this room, we always spoke of God's will. And it's true. God does have a will in a sense of God does have a, um, God is invested in us. God chooses something for us. God has a will. The problem with that word, though, as we know, is it can feel impositional in a way that, that, that takes away the freedom of the person. It takes away the freedom of the person. God doesn't do that. God cooperates with freedom, does not take it away. The image of God that I had for so long was, was sort of God um, having written the blueprint or the plan. And I just had to peek behind, from behind God's shoulders in order to find out what it was. And once I did, everything was fine. Oh, finally, I know what I want. Most college seniors I've worked with in all these Catholic college campuses, that's their idea. Father, tell me what God wants me to do. Too easy. Because that, in that sense, we become sort of God's puppets or playthings. 
We're not co-creating with God. So I want you to listen to a piece of, uh, a little piece of music. This is a, uh, Paul um, Haley and Eugene Friesen are jazz, hold one sec, just pause one sec. They are, they are j- uh, jazz composers and musicians. Eugene Friesen plays cello, Paul Haley plays keyboard. In a winter night in 1986, and I borrowed this from um, Chris Parmack, who teaches at Loyola, uh, at Xavier University in Cincinnati. It's a, he told this story which, and, and, and showed me this piece of music. Eugene Friesen invites Paul Haley to the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City on a cold winter's night in 1986. It was just the two of them. They had played in groups together, but they had never played together one-on-one. And they showed up, freezing with his cello, and Haley with his keyboard. And they just started to play. And they played one of the most amazing, they, they composed that night, one of the most amazing jazz albums called New Friend. And this is the last piece, full circle. Understand, they never practiced. This is completely improvised. Eugene Friesen on the cello, Paul Haley on the keyboards, and they are improvising. So go ahead. Listen to, imagine them now playing in a dark cathedral, St. John the Divine in New York City. What if discernment is more like this? Well, God plays and gives us a certain baseline. And we listen to that and start to play something ourselves. And God listens and then plays off of that. That we co-create with God, desire meeting desire. God has his desire, not simply a will for us, but a desire for us. And we respond with our own desire, creating the most amazing music. The catch is we don't know where the music is going to end. And if you're a control freak like me, that's a hard thing to handle. but then you get to create that.
So if you want to listen to that again, so just uh, you can go on YouTube, put in Friesen, F-R-I-E-S-E-N, F-R-I-E-S-E-N, and just uh, put in um, Full Circle or New Friend, you'll find it. It's a great album. So how does God, who is God for us? Like imagine God as a great co-composer, co-creator with me. Boy, that's a liberating, that was liberating for me in my own discernment. I didn't get that before I joined the Jesuits, but that's my operating as I discern now. That's how I think of God. He and I, the good Lord and I are, are playing music together. I'm off key often. <laughs> how does God call you? Okay, I have... I, on your, uh, at your places, I've given you some great um, pieces of art. So this is related, right? So you, you got the black and white version there, but um, the first one, it might, you know, the, the screen might be better because it's in color. This is Michelangelo's uh, conversion of Saul. You know the story. Saul on the road to Damascus, blinding light. And there he's converted. How does God call you? These two images have been very helpful to me. And I borrowed this from Jim Keenan, who's at Boston College, who introduced me to these, to these works. So there's Michelangelo's classic version. That's how most people say, blinded by the light, right? Although that's not in the scripture. But there's blinded by the light, he falls off of his horse. Um, yeah. He falls off of his horse, blinded, and there's chaos, and there's screaming, and the choirs of angels are surrounding the risen Lord up in the clouds. In one sense, this is one way that we have about call, right? That I get, and there are moments probably in our lives where we have been knocked off our proverbial horse. It might have been falling in love with someone if you're married here. It might have been, there been, could have been a moment of your, in your vocation where you felt utterly surrounded or convinced of God's presence and God's desire for you. We do all have these moments. They don't happen to me very frequently, frankly. I wish they did. Life would be so much easier. It may not be as much fun, but it would be a lot easier. God does not work this way with me But there are moments, and they are gifts. I relate more to the second image, which is Caravaggio's. So go to the next one here, is Caravaggio. Now, he's in black and white, but it's better in color here. This is Caravaggio's conversion of St. Paul. Now, Caravaggio, by the way, was, uh, was influenced by the Jesuits um, in his painting. And there's a great book, The Profane Sacred and Profane, a fantastic biography of Caravaggio that came out two years ago, The Sacred and Profane. It's actually a wonderful glimpse into this great artist uh, who can teach us a lot about faith and discernment. He's a man of the Renaissance of the earth, a very complicated man, an earthy man. Boy, boy, did he love the Lord. And he tried to captivate that in his works, including this one. But look, it's the same story. But where are, the where are the choirs of angels? Where's the bright light? Where's the almighty Lord in the distance zapping him to blindness? Where's the confusion and fear and chaos? Where's the call? Where's the call? It's all on the inside. The call for Caravaggio, for Saint, in, his, in his understanding of St. Paul, it's, it's mostly interior. And look at Paul or Saul's posture. He's on the ground, but he's like this. And you, if you see the photo up front, the, sorry, the painting up front, there's a sense of beautiful, peaceful surrender. And I think we've all had moments like that, too. This is the stuff of discernment to discern the interior landscape, to see that which will lead us to greater peace. Caravaggio's understanding of discernment, for at least St. Paul, would be it's happening inside. But that's the harder work of sifting through those pushes and pulls, those passions and desires, 
this is going to take a lot more time. It also invites us to greater freedom, which helps us own a decision more. Um, we got to look on the outside, right? I mean, because the outside can give us clues. So it's this sort of dance between looking on the outside, looking on the inside, looking on the outside, looking on the inside. This is Pedro Rupi, and then now on your table is a whole bunch of quotes from people about discernment. That's my gift to you. I've collected those over the years, so you can do what you wish with them. Thanks to Debbie for reproducing those. One of those quotes is by Pedro Rupi, who was the Superior General of the Jesuits for 1965 to 1983 in a very diff challenging times in the church, changing times in the church. But this is a very famous one that's attributed to him. Nothing is more practical than finding God, that is, than falling in love in a quite absolute and final way. What you are in love with, what seizes your imagination, will affect everything. It will decide what will get you out of bed in the morning. It will what you will do in your evenings, how you will spend your weekends, what you read, whom you know, what breaks your heart, and what amazes you with joy and gratitude. Fall in love, stay in love, and it will decide everything. Isn't that the best way to figure out how God is calling us? By that, what is, that, what is it that we love deeply? Now, we've got to sift through a lot of stuff to get there, but in the end, what is it that we love deeply? I was working with this um, young man on discerning a vocation, and he uh, good and loved it, and great, smart guy, good, good, you know, faithful. But boy, he just just loved science, being a full-time researcher and scientist and medical doctor than being a priest. And how did we know that? Because we talked about his classes, and we talked about what he did in the summers, and we talked about what choices he was making every day. And we got to the point of actually freeing him, liberating him from being, the, from being a priest, the idea of being a priest, so he could be a, just a darn good doctor and scientist. And he is exceptional, serving God in that way. You can be a priest and a scientist. Of course you can. But he wanted to give himself completely as much as he could to being a scientist and doctor, and now, uh, now a family man. Because I looked at the choices, look at the choices he was making about grad school, and look what he chose to do in the summers. Another one I was working with was a young man who was trying to figure out, do I become a priest or Jesuit or not? And we went back to his choices on, on relationships with the women in his life, and they always fell short. They never fulfilled him in the way he wanted them to. He kept, did I meet the right person or not? Ah, that's a good question. But in the end, he always found his heart not being able to love freely in those relationships. But then when he immersed himself in religious contexts and service, not to one person, but radically to a whole group of people, he found himself in a lot, alive in a way he never had before. So we looked at his choices. We looked at his relationships. We, we dived deeply. We weren't scared to go there, to, to explore romance and his sexuality and, and to explore his desires to serve. But look at decisions that we make every day and say, that's an indication of what God is calling us to do. Walter Chiswick, I'm sorry, there's a lot of Jesuit stuff here. I'm sorry, this is my background. Great Jesuit from Pennsylvania. This is great advice. The plain and simple truth is that God wills, what God wills, excuse me, the plain and simple truth is that God's will is what he actually wills to send us each day in the way of circumstances, places, people, and problems. The temptation is to overlook these things as God's will. The temptation is to look beyond those things precisely because they are so constant, so petty, so humdrum and routine and seek to discover instead some other and nobler will of God that better fits our notion of what God calls us to be. A great Jesuit spiritual director of mine said this to me early on when I just was ordained and was going to take on the world and change the church and the society of Jesus and everything in it. And I was restless in the first assignment that the Jesuits had given me. It was too small, in my opinion. <laughs> he said, Kevin... It is the height of hubris 
to think that you could do more for God's greater glory tomorrow than what God has given you to do for his greater glory today. And then he sat and looked at me in silence. It is the height of hubris to think that we could do more for God's greater glory tomorrow than we can do, for, than what God has given us to do for God's greater glory today. I didn't like hearing that, but he was absolutely right. Ajay quad agis, do what you were doing. That was the, a mantra instilled in young Jesuits for centuries. It's been lost. Ajay quad agis, do that which God has given you to do. Because in doing what God has given us today, it is revealed what we are meant to do tomorrow. I love teaching. Well, then teach more. I hate science. Don't become a scientist. I love her or him. I want to spend the rest of my life with them. I want to have children. Listen to that. We've all heard it. Pope Francis, just to restate the point here about accompanying people, we have to listen to the experience, the real experience of the people who are discerning with us. Jesus expects us, this is from Amor, Amoris Laetitia, Jesus expects us to enter into the reality of people's lives and to know the power of tenderness Whenever we do so, our lives become wonderfully complicated. Our lives become wonderfully complicated when we enter into the stories of other people's lives, people who, are, who have as equally or more complicated lives than we do. Well, we go there because the details of human lives can point to the future of where we're meant to go. But we've got to dare to go there, to give people permission and create a safe space where people actually don't mind talking about stuff that's hard to talk about, or desires they were not, they were hesitant to voice anyplace else, because those deep desires can be revelatory about where God is leading us. What a gift. And when we find encounters of um, experiences of joy inside, we can lead people there. Uh, Michael Himes from Boston College has three great questions that you might choose to frame your discernment about what gives me joy, am I good at it, does the world need it? That sort of boils it down, right? What gives me joy, that means, you know, go inside, deep joy. What gives me deep joy? And again, it can be hard. Joyful things can be hard to do sometimes. Marriage is a joyful and blessed union, but it's hard. Religious life, priesthood, it's hard, but it's joyful. So what gives me deep-seated joy? Just not happiness that can come and go, but joy. Am I good at it? That's a great correction to any type of hubris, right? Yeah, I would love to be Bono, the singer, lead singer from U2, but <laughs> I would love to do what he does. I think he's changing the world in a way I, I'm not. I'm a big fan of his. I just can't sing. <laughs> Am I good at it? Does the world need it? This is actually a great question, which I think can be very helpful, because often our discerners are choosing between two things, two very good things, or maybe three or four or five. I want to be a lawyer. Do I want to be a priest? Do I want to be a sister? Do I want to have a family? Do I want to? There can be a lot of different things, especially in young people. Does the world need it? That's actually a really great question because it frees us from, from um, gives us another perspective that sometimes we are asked to do things and th that um, because the world needs it. And again, we shouldn't do it just to be uh, martyrs, but we're called to sacrifice at times. And if we're choosing between two good things, you could actually ask yourself, what's the greater need here? What is the greater need? And to actually tell a young person, the world actually needs you. Now, it doesn't want to force you to become a priest or religious, but the world needs you. The church needs you. Ultimately, they may, they may not d decide to do it, but I think it's really empowering to actually tell someone that. The world needs you. And I've done that not just with religious vocations, but other vocations, which it can be hard. 
that may, 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 may not make a lot of money. The world needs good social workers and teachers and nurses. So you might choose that over something else. Um, this is the famous one, Frederick Buchner, right? The place God calls you to be. The place God calls you to be is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep, deep, deep hunger meet. There's that famous, where the needs of the world are, are in dialogue with your own deep desires and joys. There's a great um, uh, Chariots of Fire, you might remember that. I think it won the Academy Award in 1980, 81. It's a story of two runners. Um, uh, competing for great, in Great Britain. And the main character there is... Uh, um, Eric, Eric Lytle, and he was going to win the gold in the 24 Olympics, but he wouldn't race on a Sunday because he was, he was a devout Scotch Presbyterian. So he had to run another race, which was not his best, but he actually ended up winning the gold. And someone asks him in that movie, why do you run? I mean, you, he, wanted to be a Scot, he wanted to be a minister. He actually went to China where he died, was killed later in life, but he wanted to be a minister, but he loved running. And so in his young days, he ran. So someone asked him, like, why do you, why do you run? He said simply this, God made me for a purpose. God also made me fast. And when I run, I feel God's pleasure. God made me for a purpose. God also made me fast. And when I run, I feel God's pleasure. So that's, I love that because there the secular and the sacred are in dialogue with each other, right? The secular and the sacred are in dialogue with each other. We can find out what God wants us to do with our lives by being attentive to not just what we do in church, but when we're running or dancing or playing or working or studying. There are a few other quotes in the interest of time. We won't go over them here, but that famous quote by Rilke about digging deep to your deepest position. Why must you write, he asks a young poet, because I cannot be who I am without writing. And there's that Rilke quote, which I've given you. That's a wonderful quote to give someone. What must you do in order to live out of the deepest sense of who you are? This is a, um, the other one, I, I, I gave you a, uh, a quote from Gerard Manley Hopkins, um, a, a poem as kingfishers catch fire. And there's a beautiful line in, in, this, in this poem, and, and Hopkins is hard to read. You gotta say it out loud. And uh, we have too little time to deconstruct this poem. But what I, what I wanna actually go to is the last line there, the first stanza. What I do is me, for that I came. And what I do is me, for that I came. What I do is me, for that I came. Are we not trying to lead people to a sense of integrity and authenticity where what we do flows from the deepest sense of who they are? And aren't we happier and more peaceful people and authentic when what we do flows from the deepest sense of who we are, right? And so that is our hope for the young people we're working with that we can have them say out loud, crying, what I do is me, for that I came. When what we do flows in the deepest sense of who we are. Well, we can't figure out what we're gonna do without delving into questions of identity. What gets in the way? And in a sense, we've already done this. What gets in the way of good discernment? Too much noise and clutter, right? Days that are too filled, ears that are plugged in with every type of noise imaginable. Information which is downloaded into us at every moment, not just young people, but all of us. By what we see and read on screens, these are all good things, but we know that a lot of that noise and clutter in our lives can get away from a deep sense of peace and quiet and stillness, which will allow us to find out who am I, who is the me, and what, is, and what do I want to do? If we want to cry, what I do is me, for that I came. We need quiet and stillness in order to discover that deepest sense of who we are and what my life's passion and joy is. We have too little time. Everyone in this room can acknowledge that. We have to model good behavior. I'm really bad at it. I, 
I ask myself whether I am an obstacle to, to good discernment by not what I do in spiritual direction or vocation workshops, but what they see me doing outside. And I look at my frenetic lifestyle and I go, that's ridiculous. I'm not modeling a quiet and stillness that they need. Disordered attachments, this is another Caravaggio. This is the call of Levi or Matthew. We all have disordered attachments, things that we hold on to tightly so that our fists are relieved and we have palms that are open. The posture of good discernment is this, not this. Disordered attachments are things we hold on to too much. They become disordered. They can be very good things. I love my home. I love my parents. Of course you do, but you've got to let them go. As parents must let go of children. I have a sense of holding on too tightly to an image of myself or to a title. It was actually, it was hard to let go of being a lawyer and that privilege. That, that I, I was holding on tightly to that. I had to let it go. I love this. This is the call of St. Matthew. There's Jesus on the far right pointing. For Caravaggio, the key is you follow the light. That's how you interpret Caravaggio painting. The light goes to Matthew, and you can't really see, you can probably see it on the black and white version in front of you, a little too difficult from, from a distance. But Matthew has one hand pointing to himself, me? You're calling me? And if you look very, very, very carefully, where is the other hand? It is grasping the coins of the tax collector. This is the moment of call for us, is it not? You're calling me good Lord? But yet, I hold on so tightly to the coins of the tax collector, which could be my past. It could be an image of myself that I need to let go of, an image of God I need to let go of, a, a thing I wanted to do, or something that I'm holding on much too tightly. This is the moment of freedom that I spoke about. And Jesus ultimately will set us free. And that, in the end, is where I want to end is this notion of hope. That yes, discernment takes time, it takes practice, it is never certain. There will always be risk-taking, what I call a holy boldness. A holy boldness will be required to be good discerners. And a hope that the Lord, the good Lord, will actually free us from all that stuff. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon me and come to me and pray to me, I will hear you. And when you search me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, says the Lord. And that, in the end, in God alone do we place our hope. Every workshop, every conference, no matter how well planned, every academic piece of training you've had, everything, all your goodness, in the end, we lay it all on the good Lord in a great sign of hope, right? That God will bring something from us in a spirit of great freedom for not only the discerner, but for you and I. In God alone, we place our hope. Thank you very much for listening this morning.